look into the face of my enemy. I see my brother. I see yeah. my brother. Huh. When I look into the face of my enemy, I see my brother. I see my I just needed to understand myself much better To fight the right fight yeah. Get that vision much clearer And the things I can't stand in me They keep landing me in predicaments That would make me be a hypocrite If I was to stand in judgment Hey Mr. Fisher Mr. Fisher, can I talk to you for a second? Back off coach if you want to stay in this game I've got holding on 78 white. What are you? Are you trying to cheat my boys out the game? 15 more yards. Listen, let them play, ref. Let them play. Reasonable. Let them play. Let the boys play. Cheetah. Coach, come on. Cheetah. Coach. Go, 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 go. I know all about it, Titus. What are you talking about, Bill? You call this game fair, or I'll go to the papers. I don't care if I go down with you. But before God, I swear I'll see every last one of you thrown in jail. You dig your own grave. Defense on me! Okay, Petey, don't you drift to the strong side. Coach, they're calling a holding penalty on me every time. Did I ask for your excuses? You want to act like a star? You better give me a star effort, do you hear me? Forget about him. Alan, you're in. Come on. All right. Now, I don't want them to gain another yard. You blitz all night. And if they cross the line of scrimmage, I'm going to take every last one of you out. You make sure they remember forever the night they played the Titans. What? Leave no doubt. Set. Come on, go. Swing it left. Swing it left. Set. Hut. You gonna make yourself comfortable down there, real comfortable. Coach. All right, baby. All right. You brought us here, Coach. Run it up, Herman. Leave no doubt. All right, guys. If you haven't noticed yet in life, a lot of times the enemy does not play fair. That's for sure. It's the body of Christ. We've been dealing with this issue of ethnicity. Struggling for the last 2,000 years with issues of slavery. In case you didn't know, slavery is not over. In fact, there are more modern day slaves right now than all of history combined. Over 29 million slaves, most of them children, forced into sex trade and other industries across the world. It is an issue that continues to plague the plight of humanity, continues to be a stain on the church as we have not been able to deal with this very same thing within our own walls, so it's very hard to point out the speck in our brother's eye when we have not dealt with this issue well at all. We've been studying the book of Philemon for the last couple weeks. Uh, we looked at all 25 verses in the short letter Paul wrote to 
Philemon, uh, about the slave Onesimus. We broke it down in its whole, what it's talking about, the background of it, that Philemon literally has come under uh, the preaching and teaching of Paul's gospel there at Ephesus, most believe he was saved. He had a slave, at least one slave with him was Philemon, who runs away, he stole something from his master. He goes and he finds Paul in prison, preaching and changed, and he believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and then begins to serve and aid Paul. And Paul falls in love with Philemon and, and he, how he serves him and how he lives for Christ and how his life has totally been transformed. But he knows he has to send him back to do what is right, to make uh, means right with his master. And so he sends him back, but he writes this letter and it's basically him pouring out his heart, saying how much he wants Philemon to understand what the gospel does. Forgiveness, reconciliation, and understanding what grace is all about. He says, refresh my heart. Let me know you at least get these things. I know you'll do even more than I wrote to you. And I will be coming to stay with you, so prepare a room for me. In other words, let me check on if you actually did what I wrote. And then we looked at last week. One of the key phrases and the, one of the themes throughout the book of Philemon, one of the things that speaks volumes throughout the New Testament into the church was the theme of brothers. Understanding the words Paul used are family words. He's my son. He is my heart. He is a brother, not just in the flesh, but in the Lord, right? The ultimate term is he would learn from Jesus most likely in his three years out in the desert being taught by the Lord himself. It's the fact of that who is my brother? Who is my sister? Who is my mother but those who do the will of the Father? This is the greatest relationship, the greatest bond that we have. It's the church. We are family because we are in Christ. And so we looked at that last week. And finally we'll close this week our study of the book of Philemon looking at one of the major themes again that we have struggled with as a nation over the last 220 so years and for the last 2,000 years. The issue that most critics, especially atheists, will being bring up against Christianity, and that is what about slavery? What about the issue of slavery, right? And slaves. This book is about slavery. It's about slaves, the book of Philemon, right? We don't see anything here specifically addressed as saying the institution of slavery, all these things are evil, and why does this, this deal with it? No, we see some other things going on in here that we can learn about our current state and why we are such a uproar and distress as a nation even now, as we said between last Sunday's sermon and this Sunday's sermon, we had a lot of things kind of shake up, something that's been going on for several years now and centuries now, but it's coming more and more to light and more and more common. And as believers and as a church, we need to be able to have answers and not just remain silent because it's uncomfortable. We don't want to have those types of talks. But nonetheless, the Bible speaks specifically to these issues, and unfortunately, a lot of times, it has been used to justify the very opposite. But nonetheless, we have to deal with the issue, study ourselves to show approved, to give an answer for everyone who asks for the hope that we believe. What, what is the book of Philemon all about, and what is this slavery stuff and slaves all about? If you remember from our opening, I told you about the history of slavery, understanding that obviously God's people, we know from the very beginning, once they came into the promised land, and then once they rather received the blessing of God, and they were under slavery in Egypt, and throughout all the Old Testament, it's basically freedom, bondage, freedom, bondage, obey God, blessing. Don't obey God, cursing, born invaders, so forth, they are enslaved, right? Slavery is a huge theme throughout the Bible. In Jesus' time in his earthly ministry, there are about 10 million most estimate modern-day slaves. Their slavery was different than what we know as the transatlantic slave trade. Though there were some similarities, it was different in these major ways. It was more of indentured servitude. Some people would actually sell themselves into slavery in order to pay off a debt. Others would actually become slaves because most slaves had it well off than most poor people, which Rome was rampant with poor and po poverty all throughout the land. At least you were slave, you were somewhat guaranteed to be taken care of by your master. The main thing that was not different was that you were property. You were owned and you had no will. Your will was to obey the master. There were different rules in the Greco-Roman slave trade. There was actually laws put in place that you had to treat your slaves well and that there was penalties, right? There was laws put in place to help protect the slaves. 
Slaves could be doctors all the way down to the poorest of the poor, right? It didn't matter. It was more of a class. It was normal. It was part of society. It would be like you have kings and aristocrats, and you have your middle class, and you have your poor people, and then you had slaves. That it was just normal. It was part of what they would call the caste system there. It was more indentured servitude. It was not like what we think of when we think of slave trade, because our history is that of a brutal and disgusting trade that took place in our times. That's what we think of when we think of slavery. It's a little different, but yet, again, the key theme there is your property. You don't have a will, but in Greco-Roman slavery, you could be freed. You could get your magnition papers. Your master could grant you freedom, or you could earn your freedom. You could even become citizens. Some relationships with the master would be so close that when the master died, that the slave would actually take over the business or whatever he was a part of. So there is differences here when we think about slavery. This is basically a class system, okay? Just like we have our upper middle class, middle class, poor, and so forth. This was part of the society. That is very uh, important that we understand that as we dive into this issue. So let's stand for the reading of the word and we're going to look at verses 15 through 20 of this morning. 15 through 20 this morning. Again, some from the last week. It says, For this perhaps is why he was parted for you from a while, that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brotherly brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time and for another opportunity to sit under the preaching and teaching of your word. We pray that you would speak to us, Holy Spirit, that you would enlighten our minds and our eyes and our ears to hear, see, and to understand the things of godliness. I pray, Father, that you would help us in our minds if we have any hurt and unforgiveness, Lord Jesus, and we understand this is an intense issue, God, that you would help us, Father, that you would guide us, Holy Spirit, to all truth. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have set us free, that we were slaves to sin and death and Satan, and that you broke the chains by the death of your son on Calvary, and that you rose again, and you're coming back one day to take home your bride. And we are so grateful, Lord Jesus, that he who the son sets free is free indeed. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for freedom, but we pray for those who are in bondage, those who are still oppressed, and those who still go through the very things that we're going through now. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would be with them, that you would break the chains. We pray for the oppressors, that you would change their hearts. We pray for those modern-day slaves, as I talked about, the 29-plus million even now as I preach. Father, that you will bring redemption. You will bring those who would rescue them and bring them into the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you. We pray for our nation. We pray for the strife. We pray that the church would rise up and speak truth into error, and that we would love what there is hate. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Again, this is something we have struggled with as a church, historically, understanding these issues of slavery. I know it was something, even from my own experience, trying to figure out my own mind, even as we sung some of the lyrics today, my, with everything in our own eyes and our own ears is contextualized through our culture, through our upbringing, how we experience things. And so when I shared before with you guys, even hearing lyrics, he washes me white as snow. In my 12-year-old unregenerate heart, I'm thinking, why do I need to be white? Why do I be washed? What's wrong with my skin color? So we all contextualize the gospel. This is a great missionary evangelistic tool to help us understand. We all contextualize the gospel differently from where we come from. Oppressed people read the Bible differently than people who are not oppressed. When the slaves heard the excellent account of Moses, guess what? That story was more powerful than them than it was than anyone else because they could relate to what Moses was talking about. Just so Hitler, during the Holocaust, he gave people Bibles, but he ripped out the book of Esther out of all the Bibles. Why would he do that? Because he didn't want them to understand there was hope and deliverance that was coming, right? 
So people contextualize the gospel, the words we hear differently, and that's why we need to be sensitive to how we say things, how we understand people's feelings, how we relate to them, how we preach the gospel to them, because they are seeing it through a different lens, from a different culture, from a different background. Words don't always mean the same thing. We need to understand that when we approach the gospel, when we approach our evangelism, and the way we communicate with one another and love one another. This is key. Two great books you can read concerning these issues of slavery in the New Testament is our actual identity in Christ. The term doulos is used in the scriptures 150 times. This is the Greek word used for slave. Most of our Bibles translated incorrectly. This being because of the very things I talked about between the difference between the Greco-Roman slavery and that of the transatlantic slave trade. Most Bible translators decide to go with a weaker term or less offensive term and translate it diakonos into servant, which is what most of the times you'll see in your Bible. Every time you see the word servant, 99.9% .9 of the time that word is not servant but slave, doulos in the Greek. That word changes everything. John MacArthur wrote an entire book on it called Slave or True Identity in Christ. Ian J. Uh, e. J. Murray wrote a book called Slave, the New Testament Metaphor for Believers. This is the most common term used to describe our relationship with God, men and women, is doulos. You are slaves to Christ. In the end, you are ill, we're done, good and faithful slave. Understanding he is our master, our curios in the Greek, and we are his doulos. Master goes away, we don't know when he's going to return, he comes back to see what we have done with the things that he's given us to steward. This is one of the main examples given throughout the Gospels and the teachings. Understanding this relationship is huge to understanding your true identity in Christ. I preached an entire series on that one word. You can look at it on our website if you look to learn more about that. But moving on, this is a key thing that we need to understand. So why does it, Paul in his letter just totally obliterate, just bring up the issue of slavery and deal for it once for all? I think this is very important. Uh, John MacArthur's advice here concerning this when we talked about the strategy of the gospel going forth. The New Testament nowhere directly attacked slavery. Had it done so, the resulting slave insurrections would have been brutally suppressed and the message of the gospel hopelessly confused with social reform. Instead, Christianity undermined the evils of slavery by changing the hearts of the slaves and the masters. By emphasizing the spiritual quality of the master and the slave, the Bible did away with slavery's abuses. The rich theological theme that dominates this letter is forgiveness, a featured theme throughout the New Testament scripture. Paul's instruction here provides the Bible's definition of forgiveness without ever using the word. So rather than attack, attacking the branches or the fruit, the gospel goes right to the roots, goes right to the heart of man. It transforms the hearts of the slaves and the hearts of the masters. It helps the masters understand that they too are slaves and bought with a price, and they too one day will answer to the ultimate curios, the ultimate Lord and Master. This is huge to help understand this. This is one of the South's greatest fears, right? They said, no, we, we, we can't set the slaves free, and then they put fear into people's heart. They'll kill, they'll rape, they're not even human. We can't set them all free at once. Can you imagine what would happen because of the way we have treated them for so long? This is one of their great fears. R.C. Sproul says this concerning the book of Philemon and slavery. Paul seems to be asking Philemon to set on this and is free. It is implied that the Christian's common freedom in Christ is incompatible with the state of slavery, marked as it is by compulsion, not to mention chains. Not to mention chains. So the Bible attacks these things dealing with the hard issues, right? We all know the golden rule, right? Treat others as you would like to be treated. Paul says to go even further than that. He says consider others greater than yourselves. Slavery is totally inconsistent with Scripture and Christianity, though it has been part of it, sadly, for so long. But it is not the gospel, and it is not what Christianity teaches. Slaves first arrived in Jamestown, Virginia, 1619. A guy by John Smith, not your Pocahontas John Smith, but a guy named John Smith said, and he described these 20 slaves that got off of the boat in Jamestown, Virginia, as strange cargo. Strange cargo. He'd never seen this type of people before, and that was the way he expressed how he saw them, as strange cargo that got off 
of the ship. Understanding slavery as well, this is key, men and women, one of the things, again, that the enemy does, house of body cannot stand to get us to fight against one another again. Historically, slavery has been a part of every people group. When the Portuguese and the Spaniards landed on the African coast, there was already a well-established system of slavery going on among themselves and tribalism. And in fact, there are also many white slaves in Africa. This is also something your history books don't talk to you about. It is not a skin issue. Slavery and racism is a sin issue. All right? Keep us from fighting each other. We try to pit one side against the other. No. That's why it's called a slave trade. It takes two to tango. Some situations were manipulated, understanding trade with Portuguese and Spanish. Others felt pressure to do what they complied and wanted to happen. There was a new resource called sugar that tasted really good in tea. A guy named Christopher Columbus, should not be a holiday, by the way, in the United States, um, discovered that, hey, sugar, brought it back. The queen wanted it. Now we need mass quantities of it. So that's basically how slavery started in the Caribbean. It was the sugar cane. Temperatures up to 150 degrees, people would last, lifespan average about a year, would die. That's why they need to continue slaves to come and bring sugar so people in Europe could have sugar in their tea. That was slavery. Then became rum, another trade. And one of the things that they did is that, hey, we'll give you guns, we'll give you rum, if you go and bring us the tribes you don't like, right? For racism and all that stuff, there was tribalism. So you sell out the people you don't like, you bring them here, we can trade, we'll get you go. The only movie that actually portrays this correctly is the movie Amistad. If you've ever seen Amistad, the beginning scene, they're bringing the slave down to the shore, and then you see some of the fellow Africans there playing with the guns and the alcohol. It was a trade. Literally, that was the trade. Give us your enemies, we'll give you guns, we'll give you rum. That's how it worked. The Spaniards and the Portuguese were not used to the temperatures and the weathers and the jungles of Africa. So therefore, they would wait literally on the shore because of death and diseases that would happen. They would go deep into Africa, into Central Africa, and started bringing slaves because they needed to find more people to bring. The slave trade had boomed. Therefore, people continued to sell out each other. It's imagined some estimated over 10 million slaves died before they even made it to the shore. Those that are weak, old, and sick were literally executed on the beach. This was the transatlantic slave trade. Again, it's not a skin issue, it's a sin issue. The United States, even when this took place, you know there was 50,000 white people sent, poor and criminals, to also be indentured servants and slaves at the beginning of America's inception. They treated Irish and Italians the same way. It was not so much a skin issue as it was a class issue. The elite, poor people, poor whites, and slaves. This is, again, part of our story and our history and one of the reasons why there's so much upheaval in our land today. So how do we deal with this? How do we do this with the church? First, we have to do, as you saw in the film, call the time out, right? We've been seeing what's going on. We've been fighting against each other. There's systems and things that have been put in place. But we need to call a timeout at the church and say, you know what, we're not going to settle for what is going on. We're not going to settle for, well, it will be better in heaven when we'll all be around the throne worshiping every tribe, tongue, and nation together. Now we say, as a people of God, that we want the kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven, that we are going to seek justice, that we're going to seek realist reconciliation, right? Paul tells us that we are been reconciled to God, therefore we are ministers of reconciliation. We will not settle for the way things are, men and women. If we settle with the way things are, don't be surprised if you're back in change shortly. There's been a cycle that's happened historically throughout great civilization that starts with liberty, goes to complacency, and ends up back in slavery. That cycle is repeated throughout history and has not been broken, by the way. So don't take your freedom for granted and don't think that things are always going to be the way they are. But men and women, we have an opportunity that we are placed here. This is Esther for such a time as this. So how do we deal with these issues? Well, first we have to deal with the roots, for the problems. Why are things the way they are even today? Why are we still struggling with the same things that we read in the scriptures, the same thing we've studied in history? I'll tell you why. The clip we just saw illustrated that quite plainly. We don't understand even what the Bible teaches concerning who we are. There is no such thing as 
races in the plural. We have to get this out of our minds. This is straight from the enemy himself. I told you the original sin is not what happened in the garden. The original sin is what happened way before Adam and Eve were created in the heavens. Why was Satan kicked out of heaven? Pride. He was the worship leader. He said, you know what? I'm doing all the work. You might as well be worshiping me. Well, that didn't go over too well in heaven. He gets kicked out. There are the angels go with him and stole the very first thing he puts into the heart of Adam and Eve. And all through that is pride. He's holding back. You can be better. You can be like God. Cain and Abel, very first brothers, killed each other because of what? Because of pride. Oh, your sacrifice was in mine, was it? Oh, well, you know what? Guess what? Back on the head, he's dead. Brothers, Joseph, oh, no, no, I got the coat of colors. What happened to Joseph? Throw him in the well. Why? Pride. Same issues go on and on and on. It is pride that the Tower of Babel happened and they were dispersed in the first place. All of this is rooted in pride. You can get back to the heart of every single sin is pride. Money, sex, whatever it is, pride is the original sin. It is the sin of all sins, and it's namely the sin of racism. In order to get the term racist plural, you have now set up the perfect system to keep us divided forever because it's about who is superior, who is the master race. That's exactly what you have to do. In order to keep a people divided, you have to make them think they're better than one another. One has to be superior, therefore by default, one has to be what? Inferior. Inferior. And this is just not to one color of brown shade of skin. This has been historically, as I said, what people do to one another, even of the same shade of brown. Inferiority. And that's what... Paul is hitting at here in verse 17. He says, so if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. In other words, treat this slave the same way that you would treat me. Paul, the apostle, the leader of the church, the one who brought you to faith. Treat this slave who stole from you, who ran away from you, treat him the same way that you would treat me. Think about it this way. By leaving. Here's Apostle Paul wants to come to house, his house. How do you think he's going to treat the Apostle Paul, right? He's going to go all out, is he not? He's going to roll out the red carpet. He's going to do everything he can. The Apostle Paul is coming to stay at my house. Does Jesus not teach these very things in his parables? Do not take the highest seat. Take the lowest seat. That's why people are oppressed, understood, and were so excited about the gospel despite what the master taught them. Because they understood what Jesus, the true master, taught that he was always for the low, always for the oppressed. He put the elite in their place, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He always said, no, 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 this is actually who the kingdom of God is for. This is who I'm coming for. He always focused in on that, that understanding that so long people have put others down in order to elevate themselves. That's why Jesus says to humble ourselves, right? He who humbles himself will be exalted. Exalted. We looked at the scriptures concerning how we should view one another. Not as inferior, but as brothers, right? Ephesians 2, 13 through 6, and we talked about that the whole point of the curtain tearing is that he made one man out of two. One new man, Jew and Gentile, now become one. The wall of hostility has been divided, has been torn down. So making in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace that might reconcile us both to God and one body through the cross, thereby killing hostility. Paul hammers over and over again, Galatians 3.28, there's no longer Jew nor Greek, ethnicity issue, there's no longer slave nor free, class issue, there's no longer male or female, gender issue, and for we all one in Christ. This is the whole point. The Bible is specifically against this whole superiority and inferiority complex. We have to get this through our minds. Again, as we saw earlier, Acts 17, 26, that he made one man from one blood, from every man, one nation of mankind, to live in all the face of the earth, having determined a lot of the periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. No one should be bragging for something you had no control of. If you're born in Africa, Asia, Europe, Australia, Texas, Alabama, you don't control where you're born, you don't control where your parents are, you don't control any of that. God says, I do. And if you have an issue with the way someone looks, you take it up with God. Amen. He created all of us. 
Matthew, as we said, 12, 48, 50. For whoever who does the will of my Father in heaven, that is my brother, my sister, and my mother. Jesus makes clear how we have to view one another, especially those who are in Christ. Those who are in Christ. So America, present day, things we're dealing with. What happened? How did we get to where we are? Well, this same thing was put into place that is continuing to abide us, continuing to help us to not be able to be the church we were called to be. I mean, the biggest thing, as I mentioned, is slavery. All right? Slavery. All that took place. All the things that literally done in the name of Christ. The Puritan said that we will be a light to the world and that we would use slave trade to bring about the kingdom of God. Today, oppressed pagans would be in a better off state if they were oppressed Christians, that they would be better to serve. This was their thinking. Then, not only was it backed by religion, right? And then came the curse of Ham, the famous curse of Ham, that now put God's stamp of approval on this atrocity of the slave trade. The curse of Ham said, well, because Cain was cursed, one of Ham's sons, therefore, all of Ham's descendants forever cursed to slavery and to disobey this is not the will of God. So now you've manipulated the mind. Psychologically, people think, well, I'm inferior. Now it's being backed by preachers and the Bible is being used to tell me that I'm also inferior, that I am cursed. Dark skin, I remember a couple years ago when Mitt Romney was running for presidency, this came back into light, the curse of Ham. Mormons still traditionally believe this. They've been trying to cover it up and kind of doctrine it up a little bit, but they still believe in the curse of Ham, that if your skin is dark, it's because in their opinion, in their theology, that you didn't join Jesus' brother Satan to come save the world, therefore you're cursed with dark skin. Well, the curse of Ham is totally unbiblical in the twisting of the Bible because the curse of Ham deals with Canaan, one of Ham's sons who was cursed. Not all of his sons, he had four sons. And the New Testament, Old Testament teaches that even the curses of itself only last three to four generations. And only that, those who've come for forgiveness and repentance, the curse is broken. So the curse of Ham was a joke, but of course, the literate people could not understand this, and therefore this was used to manipulate, control, and used to build this country, sadly. The curse of Ham. 1863, Emancipation Proclamation. Yes, great freedom came to the land, all the fighting, all the deaths on both sides, but then what happened? Well, the enemy introduced what is called evolution, Darwinism. Step two, plan B, right back to where we started. Not many people know, even Richard Dawkins, when he's interviewed, even knew on the spot what the original title of Darwin's book is. We learn in your schools and your science classes, origins of the species. Well, guess what? Just like a lot of things, as we've come to find out in the last couple weeks, there have been things that have been edited about a lot of things in our country, and this is one of them. The original title of Darwin's original Origins of the Species was Darwin's Origins of the Species and the Preservations of the Favored Races and the Struggle for Life. Darwin was a huge racist, probably worse than Hitler, literally tore apart the Aboriginal people, almost made them to extinction, and he hunted them down because he thought they were the missing link of evolution. He even wrote books on how to skin them alive and how to put their skulls in museums, and a lot of what he taught would go on to be used in eugenics in America and ultimately in the camps in Nazi Germany. Hitler looked up to the eugenics. Darwinism, the very thing introduced into our school system that is embraced as one of the most racist theories ever made. Namely this, that there are what? Five major races. This was introduced as Darwinism. So church, when we say racist, what we are saying is not biblical, it's not a biblical worldview, it's not even scientific. It is racist, Darwinism. Master races, therefore, pride. We have major races, we have the Native Americans, we have blacks, we have the Europeans, we have the Asians, but of course, white Europeans are the greatest race. This was taught all the way up in the late 1900s in your history books. If you went to school, you would read this. Blacks resembled closest to the apes. They were less human, subhuman, 
who would also make many other laws in her history, three-fourths of the person, votes don't count. Again, the idea that you're not brothers, you're inferior. You're not even human. Birth of the Nation, the film came out, still is in the U.S. Library of Congress, sadly preserved, taught this very thing that whites were supreme. They were the master race. And KKK were the heroes of the United States. Again, this was taught in America less than 100 years ago in your textbooks and in the public square. And then we all know a little closer to history, what took place after that. You have Pleurisy and Ferguson, 1896. You have Jim Crow laws that come into place to teach the same thing. You're inferior. You can't drink from this water fountain. You can't go to this bathroom. You can't go to this restaurant. Of course, even we know that when the Olympics came along, right? You may have seen the movie Race, Jesse Owens. Sometimes even racism gets trumped by nationalism, right? Jesse Owens goes to the Olympics. Hitler won't shake his hand if he shakes all the hands of the Olympians. Jesse Owens comes back with his gold medals, goes to a, literally, a ceremony hosted for him in honor of what he's done, and he's told, you can't enter here. The kitchen's that way. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. This same theme goes throughout our culture. Inferior. You view someone as inferior, as an enemy, there will never be peace. There will always be hostility, there will always be fights and riots until the church opens their mouth and speaks biblical truth into these situations rather than being quiet and hiding. We will no longer see each other as brothers, definitely not brothers, in the Lord. Do they have a soul was one of the main questions of those who sought to evangelize slaves. Do they even have souls? One said, you might as well baptize puppies. You might as well baptize puppies. Charles V. Hamilton said they attempted to teach the slaves to be docile, to accept their inferior status, for to do so would be the will of God. To fail to do so is a rebellion against God and a risk of eternal punishment. In Christianity Today in 2014, Mark Gell said this. He said, one of the largest obstacles was sheer prejudice. Many masters believed that Africans were too brutish to comprehend the gospel. Others doubted Africans had souls. Anglican missionaries to South Carolina, Francis de Jaw reported in 1709, many masters can't be persuaded that Negroes or in Indians are otherwise, other, or otherwise than beasts and to use them as such or like such. Such thinking was combated by men like the Puritan Cotton Miner, who struck in his track the Negro Christianized pleaded with owners to treat their servants as men, not brutes. Thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself. Man, thy Negro is thy neighbor. Other masters believed the conversion would make slaves saucy, since they would begin to think of themselves as equal to whites. According to John Bragg, a Virginia minister, slave owners agreed that conversion resulted in slaves becoming worse slaves when Christians. Some even believe the slave is ten times worse a Christian than in a state of paganism. A Virginia law put it, if it was passed that masters free from this doubt may more carefully endeavor to propagation of Christianity. So many things, man. There's so much history. There's so much emotional hurt and scars to the very issues that we're trying to deal with today. But if we don't know what the issues are, if we don't know the root of those issues, if we don't know really what the Bible teaches about these issues, there is no hope to ever solve it now. The Zong Massacre. The murder of 133 Africans by a slave crew in November 29, 1781. Slaves were viewed as strange cargo. Slave ship owners threw Africans off ships just to collect insurance money. One famous case was that of the ship owned by William Gregson and George Case. Both were mayors of Liverpool in England. The captains threw off 133 slaves into the sea because it would, it would, if they were to die naturally, the owners would lose money. But if Africans, but people were thrown alive into the sea, supposedly for their safety of the crew, it would be a loss of the underwriters. And yes, 133 slaves tied together and flown into the ocean to die. They took it to court, and they were never prosecuted. 
They didn't win the case. It's their insurance case, but they were never prosecuted for what it was, murder. Why? Because they were cargo, not people. Not people. So then issues that we deal with today, things that we've been struggling with, things that have been in the news, because so much of our education is edited, sadly, we don't learn the truth about a lot of things. Why? Again, to continue to keep us divided, to paint a prettier picture than we really understand. Some of our heroes aren't really heroes if you actually study what they believe. This quote comes from someone you might know. A distinct and inferior race of people, which all experience proves to be the greatest evil that afflicts, afflicts a community. The greatest evil that afflicts a community. That men and women is Francis Scott Keys, the author of the Star Spangled Banner that we sing. Ask yourself this, if you were African American, would you want to sing that song? Written by someone who said you are an inferior race of people, which all experience proves to be the greatest evil that afflicts a community. Probably not. But yet, if we don't know our history, we don't know how to understand what people are going through, nor how to be compassionate to those who might see things differently than we see them. Ken Ham wrote this in his book, One Blood, One Race, the biblical answer to racism. The widely held view that blacks evolved from a strong but less intelligent gorillas, and orientals evolved from the orangutan, and most intelligent of all primates, the chimpanzees. Across the globe, such conclusions were used to justify racism, oppression, and genocide. Odebenga, 1981, one of those who I told you about, an aborigine, he was about 4'11", 103 pounds, he was the first person ever to be brought over and put on display for people to see. He was displayed in the Embolic Savage in the Anthropology Wing in 1904 in St. Louis in the World Fair, and he was taken back home. Later after that, found out his wife had died, his people rejected him because he had contact with white people, he was then brought back in September 09, 1906. For the first time in U.S. history, a human being was put on display in a cage next to chimpanzees. He was at the zoo. He was at the zoo for many weeks and months before a group of black, black pastors got together to protest and get him out. He later was baptized, proved rapidly in his vocabulary, cared for children, learned to read, attended classes in Lynchburg, Virginia, but become deeply depressed by the things that has happened to him, death of his wife, rejection of his people, and the realization that he would never go home. So people noticed when he spoke, he had tears in his eyes, and he would say he wanted to go home, realizing that he would never return to his native land. Oda put a revolver to his chest and sent a bullet through his heart on March 20th, 1916. So men and women, there is a lot more to the story than we see on the surface. There's a lot more to what we understand. A lot of times we ask the question, why is this like this? Why is this like that? But we never take the time to study. We never take the time to say, what, what, what is really going on? What is the heart of the issues that we are facing? It's deep. There are deep wounds. It cannot just be forgotten or gotten over it. Thirdly, or rather, I would read this from Tony Evans' book, One is Embraced, concerning this issue and how it affects all of us when we see anyone as inferior. He says this on page 90. He says, acceptance of the myth that African Americans are inferior to Anglos has a catastrophic consequences to the psyche of black people, the worldview of white people, and the harmony among the races. Again, we use races here, ethnicities. Worst of all, it has hindered the church from being salt and light in America. On one hand, this myth has kept the white church from appreciating the black church's contributions to a true understanding of biblical Christianity and from the incorporating of those contributions to its own church life and doctrine. You can't appreciate what you don't know. On the other hand, the myth has kept the black community from fully embracing our heritage and using it as a foundation for addressing the cataclysmic crisis in the African American community. Spiritual assessments carry the weight of culture's ability to understand itself as a whole as well as its components. When a culture allows a myth to dominate the way various groups within the culture relate to each other and to themselves, there will be disharmony, injustice, and quality on every level of that culture. 
Such has been and still is the case in America. This reality has led to our society's inability to understand itself, and what we can do not understand, we cannot fix. We cannot fix. We don't start teaching the truth of the scriptures, the truth of true history, and not this predominantly one history, understanding that a lot of times even in our schools, why does our history, black history, start with slavery? Why does it not start where it should start in Africa, where Greeks and Romans came to be educated? Understanding the, the person whose nickname, the second founder of Christianity, was St. Augustine, who was North African and darker skinned than me. But we don't talk about that. If you look up a picture of St. Augustine, he will be whiter than my wife. Ask yourself, why is that the case? Because of the very thing that we're talking about, many women. You don't know your history, you don't have much of a future. People who don't know their history, their heroes, their contributions, that we much, much less progress. Men and women, we need to know the truth. The truth is what sets us free. The truth is what unites us. The truth is what brings reconciliation and true forgiveness into our lives. Paul ultimately says in verse 18 through 20, as he goes on, if I have wronged you or owe you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write with my own hand. I would pay it to say nothing of your own of me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit in you, Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. What is Paul telling him here? He is telling him, yes, you may have hatred for him in your heart, but forgive him just as you have been forgiven. Knowing that Paul offers to be the Christ figure, that I will pay the debt. I will step in. I will be the substitutionary atonement. I will pay the ransom if that's what it takes. Men and women, that needs to be our heart. That we understand, as Luke 6, 37 said, forgive and you will be forgiven. Ephesians 4, 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. That would be the key point Paul is trying to get across the final year. As God in Christ forgave you, refresh my heart and forgive honestness. Colossians 3, 13, bear one another, if so... There's a complaint of one another, forgive each other. As the Lord has been given you, so you also must forgive. This is why the Protestant reformer Martin Luther said, we are all God's omniscience. We are all God's omniscience. Men and women, when you look at the story, a lot of times we put ourselves in other people's shoes, in the hero's shoes, a lot of times, no, men and women, we are all omniscience. We are all slaves. We are all dead in our trespasses and sin. We need to be free. All of the New Testament language concerning your salvation is slave language. Redemption literally means redeem to purchase someone from the slave block. Jesus knew what was going on in his time. He observed the culture and he used the words precisely for that very reason. You are being redeemed. You were bought with a price. Peter says, First Peter 1, 18 and 19, not as perishable things as gold or silver, but by the precious blood of the Lamb. We were slaves without hope in this world. Children of wrath by nature. There's no one who seeks God. No, not one. They've all, like sheep, gone astray. No one seeks understanding. We all have a curious the Lord that we were answer to. When people ask you the question, when critics ask you the question, when you ask yourself, maybe your, your own self, the question, what about slavery? What about racism? Know this. Slavery and racism are part of the curse of the fall of man. No ethnicity is exempt. But thanks be to God, the king of all kings became a slave for us, men and women. Philippians 2, 4 through 11, that he humbled himself, taking the very nature of a, not a servant, do laws of a slave. Jesus became the king who was the king, became the slave, the lowest of lows. From the very top, king of all kings, not to a servant. Servants got paid and hired to do a job. Remember the younger brother in the story, Luke 15, 4? I will go back, I will hire myself out, I will pay it back. I don't know. Slave. Only slaves wash feet. Servants didn't wash feet. Jesus takes the towel, washes his disciples' feet. He became a slave for us that he can relate to everyone, especially the lowest of 
the lows. And when you say he doesn't know what it feels like to be a slave, yes, he does. Yes, he does. In fact, the prophecy that was in the Old Testament came true in the New Testament that Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. It doesn't stop there, does it, men and women? Which is the price of a slave. This is why this is huge, men and women. This is huge, especially for your oppressed brothers and sisters. When they say, what about slavery? Let me tell you about the greatest slave ever. Let me tell you about the doulos, who was the king who humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross, to set you free. To set you free. The most used metaphor for believers in a relationship with God, doulos, to set us free from sin, death, and Satan, Romans 8, 2. That's why it's called redemption, to buy or purchase a slave at the market. And that's why Judas sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver, Zechariah 11, 12, Matthew 26, 15, the price of a slave. Jesus was kidnapped in the night by his own people. Judas is kissed in the Pharisee scheme, as well as handed over to the Romans to be whipped and killed. Sound familiar? Our great high priest can not only relate to African Americans and all those who have been oppressed throughout history, but to all humanity. He was 415 that he's our great high priest. He's able to sympathize with us. That also why Paul tells us that we Christians are no longer slaves to sin, but slaves to righteousness. Romans 6 and John 8, 31. We now have a new master, a new curiosity. We have been set free from our old master and father, Satan. 2 Timothy 2, 25-26, John 8, 44. The entire New Testament our salvation is wrapped up in slave master terminology from the parables to historical context that Jesus walked. The majority of times, again, you see the word diakonos in your Bibles. It's actually the Greek word slave. It's called the Atlantic slave trade for a reason, and our redemption has historically been referred to as the great exchange. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. He didn't use, did not use things as gold or silver to redeem us or purchase us back. As 1 Peter 1, 18 said, he used the precious blood of the Lamb to redeem us. And only a king who left heaven to become a slave could lead us back to God. In the same way, only those who leave earth as slaves of Christ get into heaven and reign with the king. 2 Timothy 2.12 and Revelation 26. And then we might pray that we would all hear these words from Jesus today. Matthew 25, 21. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful of a few things. Now I put you in charge of many things. Share in the joy of your master. Men and women, you've been bought with a price. We've been set free to set others free. And unless the church can grasp this message, can get it in our hearts as believers, can get it in our hearts, minds, and soul. We will continue to see the things that we see weekly and monthly. We have no answer because we're so divided ourselves. Men and women, we have to become the pillar and buttress of truth once again. We have to be the church. Those who the world sees the way we love one another and glorify our Father who is in heaven. The way we love one another, the way we interact. We are blessed even in this small congregation that we have multiple ethnicities and cultures. This is rare, men and women. It's not even rare, it's miraculous. 92% of the church is what we call homogeneous. It means the more majority culture is all one ethnicity. Only 8% of the church, men and women, has over what even the mark of a non-homogeneous church is, is only 15% other. 8% of the church has 15% other. How are we supposed to be the light of the world? How are we supposed to speak in today's culture, into today's issues, when we are so divided ourselves? Even more rare, probably not even being able to record statistically, is a church that is multi-ethnic and has someone who looks like me preaching. Very rare. Very rare. And because of the very things we're talking about, superiority, not understanding there's one race, the church continues 
like the Tower of Babel, to go its separate ways and to hang out with those who look like them, talk like them, dress like them, have the same amount of money in the bank as them, and we're no longer the witness, the salt of the earth and the light to the world. I pray that we would understand this and ultimately understand that even when we talk about slavery, no matter what the issue is or what the book is in the Bible, everything points us to Christ Jesus, the ultimate answer and Savior and the only answer the world has for any issue. He became a slave, the king, to set us free. Closing with this clip. Years ago, an Englishman had gone out to California, made his fortune in the gold fields. He wanted to go back and live with his own people. So he sent his money by check around uh, back to England, and he came overland on the Santa Fe Trail to Kansas City and down the Missouri, and then the Mississippi, and ended up in New Orleans, where he was going to take ship to New York and from there to England. And as a tourist in New Orleans, he did as most tourists do. He went down to the slave market only then, in the early 1850s. There were still slaves being sold. And as he went into the market, he saw a lot of men gathered there, and one party was put on, and he heard the men as they were speaking about her. He saw two evil-looking men bidding for her quite heatedly. And then he heard them say what they would do with her. And his heart just revolted against the whole swinish thing. And finally, when they were bidding, and the biddings were getting, prices were getting very high and smaller, he just couldn't stand it, and so he beckoned to the auctioneer and he said, a figure which was exactly twice the last bid, utterly beyond anything that had ever been paid for a slave in that market before. He said, have you got the money? And he came up and he said, yeah, you got the money. And so the bill of sale was made out, he went over to the block to take the woman that he'd purchased. And as she came down one step and stood just about level with his eyes, she had made a mouth full of spittle and she spat right full in his face and hissed through her clenched teeth, I hate you. He said nothing with the back of his hand, he wiped the spittle away, took her by the hand, walked down the street across this intersection through the mud down that street till he came to a little office building. She couldn't read, didn't know what it was. He went to the desk began to speak. The man behind the desk began to protest. He said, I insist, it's the law, I insist. And finally, he came back, paid some money, and got a paper. He walked over to the woman that was like a beast ready to spring on him. He handed the paper out and said, Here, here are your manumission papers. You're free. She still hissed, I hate you. I said, didn't you understand? I said, here are your manumission papers. You are free. She said, I know this is, you, you, no. You paid twice as much for me as they've ever paid for anybody in that block. And you're giving me the... I don't believe it. He said, yes. These are your manumission papers. And he put them in her hand. And she said, stop. Mister, do you mean to say that you bought me to set me free? He said, yes. That's why I bought you, to set you free. Tears came up into eyes that hadn't known tears for a long time. It gets spilled over. Her face softened. And then she slipped down on her hands and knees. And she reached down and put her hands around those rough miners' boots. And then laid her cheek down on the toe of one of them. And through her tears she sobbed, Oh, you bought me to set me free. You bought me to set me free. You paid more than has ever been paid before just to set me free. And then through her tears, she looked up and said, Oh, sir, all I want in life is to be your slave. You bought me to set me free. Listen, the Lord Jesus Christ bought you to set you free. And when you understand that, then it's the joy of your life 
to come and stand against the door of grace and let him bore through the ear of your heart that you can be as born slave forever. He bought you. He bought you to set you free, not only from hell, but from the world and the flesh and the devil. He bought you to set you free. Oh, come to him. Kiss his nail pierced feet and take from his hand that great salvation that he purchased with his blood. And remember, he bought you to set you free. Thank you again just for your word and for your truth. Lord, we pray that it would permeate the earth, God, and that your people would rise up of all ethnicities, male, female, but from every class, from every tribe, from every nation. Lord, that we would bring the message of hope, the true gospel. Lord Jesus, that we would stand firm in the face of opposition, or the enemy would call us to hate that we would love. Lord Jesus, that we would hate the things that you hate. Father, that you would help us to truly be ministers of reconciliation, God. Lord, we pray for our nation, for our world. Lord, we know that you are the only answer that breaks our hearts. To see both sides arguing and fighting, God, we pray for unity. Lord, we pray for clarity. We pray for understanding and wisdom. Lord, we pray for a miraculous interaction and intervention of your spirit, Lord Jesus. God, help us. Help us to truly follow you. Lord, you bought us to set us free. We would not use our freedom as an occasion for the flesh but to truly to live for you, to know you and to make you known, God. Lord, we need everyone. We need to be united. We have a common enemy, God, and it's not each other. I pray, Lord Jesus, for unity based on truth, the truth of who you are and your word in Christ's name. Amen.